Amen. No better example of a seed that's sown, of how it can multiply and make a great difference, not only in somebody's life, but for the kingdom of God. And everything that Jesus did, every seed that Jesus sowed, every story that Jesus told, he did so with an intentional, purposeful meaning behind it so that we could be here today. And that's really what we're studying in a series of messages called The Timeless Stories of Jesus. We're in our fifth week of that series today. And if you don't know me, my name is Kevin Rivers. I'm one of the uh, spiritual formation pastors here at Midway, oversee our adult uh, ministries and life groups. And our lead pastor, Todd Wright, has taken two of our other staff members, Kyle Edenfield, who leads worship, and Frank Vaughn, our new student pastor over all of our student ministries, and has gone to uh, South Africa and will be ministering in the area of Swaziland. And so we want to pray for them and lift them up. Uh, As you saw in the video earlier, God has allowed us to partner with so many awesome ministries that spread the seed of the gospel, not just across the street, but around the world. And we're so excited about all that God's going to do through them while they're there. But how awesome is it that while they're spreading the seed of the word out in Africa, we can be here and spread the seed right across our street. And we can learn how to be better disciple makers even here today. So we're going to continue our series. I want to thank our worship team uh, as well today. Lori and several of those who led worship today uh, actually had their proms last night. What an example and a testimony of some young folks and and not so young folks all together, worshiping together that would go to prom, maybe not get hardly any sleep, but get up the next morning and come sing for Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So let's thank them as well. And so today, as we continue this series, we think about the seeds that are sown. Uh, I want to ask you a question. How many times have you thought about the impact of a seed? And how many times have you seen an impact of a small seed being planted in your life come to fruition in everything that you do and say? And so if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about stories. And so I had everybody in the worship center and we talked in church. Anybody remember that? Anybody here two weeks ago? Uh, We're going to do that again. Is that okay with everybody? I'm going to break the ice a little bit, let you tell a story or two to each other. I want you to think about that question. What is a seed that has been sown in your life or a person who's sown seeds into your life that every day, whatever you do, that impact of those seeds they sowed impacts you today? And I want you just to tell briefly, tell that story to one of your neighbors. I'll give you an example. Uh, One of mine, it can be something as simple as this. My granddad always said, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And so I approach everything I do now today, and I think about that saying that was said over and over and over to me. It was planted in me and implanted, implanted in my brain and in my heart and in everything I do. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. So that would be one example. It could go a lot deeper than that. Share one of those stories with your neighbors. We can talk in church for just a few minutes. Go ahead. Isn't it awesome to stroll down memory lane and look back at the seeds that are sown? And how many times do you get to talk in church, right? I used to get pinched when I talked in church, but now we're telling you to do it. It come to Midway and then we tell you to talk in church. But think about those seeds. And now that you've got the blood flowing and you're thinking about the impact that a seed can have and how much of an impact and how lasting of an impact. A lot of the things you talked about just now, some may be recent, but most of them probably happened a long, long time ago. And they still impact you today. That seed has multiplied. And so that's what we're going to look at as we continue this story. Jesus planted a lot of seeds A lot of seeds He wrote his word and we're here today Because of the seeds he planted And so I want us to put a little context Around what we're studying This timeless stories of Jesus We're looking at the parables of Jesus And as we think about those parables Those stories Jesus was a master at telling stories But every story he told Think about this He told the story that we're going to look at today, Luke chapter 8. You can be flipping there if you've got your Bibles. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. is the parable of the sower. We've looked at several stories, but all of the stories we've looked at, the story we're going to look at today, Jesus told with you in mind. 
Jesus told every story he told. Jesus sowed every seed that he spread while he was here in his short time on earth with the knowledge that he was doing so, spreading the seed of his word in a way that would cause it to multiply. And because it multiplied, you're sitting in the seat you're sitting in today. Because it multiplied, we are the church today. We're not at church today. We're not called just to go to church. We're called to be the church And Jesus was spreading and sowing the seeds that started and multiplied that church with every story that he told. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at this other story. So far, we've looked at Luke 15, the parable of the lost son. Uh, Luke 7, the parable of the forgiven debt. It was in context of the sinful woman that came to see Jesus while he was at the Pharisee's house. If you remember our pastor walking us through that story in Luke 7, it was just after that that our story today is going to happen. We've also looked at Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then last week, the parable of the Great Supper in Luke 14 is where we were. But today, Luke chapter number 8. And so we're very excited about continuing that. And the story of today goes something like this. Many of you uh, saw the impact of stories as you came to the Discipleship Boot Camp. Uh, Last Sunday, you gave your whole day. See several of the shirts. If you were not here, uh, we just simply talked about how God has called us to be better, growing disciple makers for Jesus. And we had over 200 leaders here that gave their whole day uh, last Sunday just to talk about that subject. But at the heart of that subject were stories like what we're going to talk about today and how even the stories of Jesus just paved the way for disciple making and multiplication of faith in our life. And so thank you for being a part of that. Even if you weren't here last week, you are a direct part of that storytelling and of that disciple making here at Midway. After Jesus had dealt with the sinful woman that we talked about in Luke chapter 7 a few weeks ago, he went out and he was in the heat of his ministry. So you can kind of get the picture here. Jesus went places, he taught, he told these stories, and he would stop and great crowds would gather around Jesus. And it was this circumstance that led us to Luke chapter 8, where he was now in the heat of his ministry, paving the way for the church. And a great crowd came to him and he told one of his stories. And we're pretty, anybody grew up on a farm in West Georgia? Anybody worked on a farm? Several of us were in West Georgia. We drive by and we see farms. Uh, I grew up and worked on a farm quite a bit as a child and a youth. And so I've seen and grown a lot of work ethic from from that. But there's a lot of work that goes into sowing seeds and doing a garden. Anybody doing a garden? It's about that time. Okay, lots of you doing that. But here's what Jesus did. He told a story and said something like this. He said, I want to tell you a story about a farmer. This farmer had a plan. This farmer had worked all year. He knew the season when it was time to sow, and he went out to sow his seed. And as he went out, he threw the seed out, he spread the seed, and it fell on four different types of soil. And one of the types of soil was the pathway that was cut through there where people would walk throughout the garden, throughout the fields. And in that pathway, it would be beaten down and hard. Some of the seed fell there on the hard ground, and the birds came before the seed could take and picked up the seed and took it away. Uh, Some of the seed fell on rocky ground. On the rocky ground, there was no foundation that roots could grow in. There was no moisture, and so they could not get the roots and grow. It sprung up, but it just withered away and died. Uh, Some of the seed fell on thorny ground, and it sprung up, but with it also sprung up the thorns, and the thorns choked out the plants, choked out the crop, and so it killed it. And then some of the seed, lastly, fell on good soil, and that good soil allowed it to cultivate and grow and become a foundation that brought about a massive crop a hundredfold from what the seed had sown. And Jesus told that story, and he tied it to us and to where we are in our life. And that's the story today. But I want us to do what we talked about last week, if you were here for some of the leadership training. Let's go back and actually read that now that we've thought about that story in our context. Luke chapter 8, beginning there in verse number 4. If you're ready for the word, say amen. Verse number four says, And when a great multitude had gathered, they had come to him from every city. He spoke to them by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. That's the pathway. And it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Verse eight, But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he continued on. And I love this part, uh, beginning there in verse 9. We talked a couple of weeks ago about how the disciples would often look to Jesus and say, Jesus, nobody knows what you're talking about. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Please explain. And Jesus' answer may baffle you. You may have seen it and wondered why he said this. So we'll explore that briefly. He said, then, it says, then the disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? One of those moments. I'm sure I would be asking that question if I was with him. And he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a concept through which Jesus approached everything. We talked about being a trader a couple of weeks ago, trading our priorities for God's priority. It goes against the grain, and that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, but to the rest is given in parables that, and this is quoting an Old Testament scripture, and Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy in this. He said, seeing that they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Jesus was saying that I know I'm planting seeds right now. And it goes against the grain of everything that you have ever heard. It's going to go against the grain of even people centuries from now. And Jesus understood that context and that everyone wouldn't be able to understand all that he would come to convey to them. But that those seeds would multiply and grow. And that people like you and I could come to understand them better because of the seeds he was planting. And that's why he explained them to the disciples knowing that everybody wasn't going to be able to understand and fulfilling that prophecy. Aren't you glad that he did that and that he clarified a little bit? Because if he wanted to, he could have left it way up here and we're way down here and we could never understand what Jesus was trying to say. But he made it where we could grasp it and take it and live it out. Aren't you glad for that? Amen? Amen. Verse 11, and then he explains it. I love that he does that and he's going to do that for us today. Verse 11, now the parable is this, the seeds of the word of God. Those by the wayside, and ties it to people here, who hear the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Verse 13, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with the cares, riches, pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. The ones who fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. I want to be that one. Amen? Amen. So let's talk about those and some lessons that we can learn from what Jesus was talking about. He was no doubt spreading seeds that would lead us to where we are today. And so I want to give you the bottom line today before we talk about three key lessons from sowing, three key lessons from planting from this story that Jesus has given us. The bottom line today, if you're taking notes, write this down is that faith multiplication. Jesus came so that faith would be multiplied. Jesus came so that we would be here as a multiplication effect of what he did in his time on earth and starting the church. He said, I'm going to begin my church. I'm going to establish my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he started that with us in mind. But here's what it started with was multiplication. And so the key thought, the bottom line today, is that faith multiplication always begins with a single seed. Faith multiplication always begins with a single seed. In this story, the seed is the word of God. And you think about how small a seed is and the potential of one seed. You can't see it, but I'm holding up a seed here. And you think about the soil. This is potting soil. So this is the stuff that you buy and you really know it's been prepared and ready for some seeds, right? And sometimes there's the rocky, thorny stuff that we don't want to, the red Georgia clay, amen? Anybody ever dealt with that? And with that, we don't, the seeds don't do too well on those. But God said that the seed of his word was going to go forth and it would be multiplied. And you think about how it goes into the soil. Are we the kind of soil that Jesus talks about that allows for multi- multiplication? Jesus is going to multiply. God's going to multiply his word no matter what. But are we this kind of soul that's been prepared and seasoned for that growth and multiplication? Or do we allow thorns and all these other things to come in? So we're going to explore a few of those areas today. I'm going to give you a few lessons uh, from planting, a few lessons from sowing today. Number one, let's look at the sower's plan. The sower's plan. Aren't you glad that God has a plan? Sometimes I look at my life and think, I'm glad somebody's got a plan. And some of you thought that this morning. You got up this morning, you looked at yourself in the mirror, and it was raining, and it was really early, and you wanted to just go back to bed, and you decided somehow to get back up. And then you looked in the mirror and said, good night, I should just go back to bed. But you rolled out of the bed, and you're here because I know this about you because you did come. You believe that there is some kind of plan for your life. You believe that there's something, even if you don't really and you're really not totally sure about this whole God thing that the church talks about all the time, there's something bigger out there. Maybe you're searching for that today. Or if you're a believer, you know God has a specific plan for your life. And so you rolled out of the bed, even in the rain and the dreariness, and said, I'm going to go to church and hear from the word of God so I can go out and spread those seeds along with my Jesus. And that's what God has called us to do because God does have a plan. The sower had a plan. 
Luke chapter 8, verse 5 says, A sower went out to sow his seed. He didn't do that at some weird time, just woke up and said, Hmm, I've got some seed, I've got some soil, I'm going to go out and just throw it out and we'll see what happens. If you are planting a garden, some of you have tried that approach, right? <laughs> Did it work? No. It didn't work that way. But you know the time. You know the season. You know the plan that you've got to have. You've got to prepare the soil. You've got to do it at the right time. You look at the rain. You look at all these different things and when you can do it so it would have maximum benefit. The sower in this story had a plan. God has a plan. God is the sower. If the seed is the word of God, then he's the one that has the plan. Then he's the sower that's sowing those seeds. You're not the sower and you're not the seed. You're the soil. I won't jump ahead. We're going to talk about the dirt, but we're all dirt, Jesus says in this story. We're going to get there in a few minutes, but before we do, let's talk about that sower and the plan that he had. And here's what I think about the plan. And when looking at the stories Jesus told and looking at my life, I know so many times I get consumed and cluttered by the unknown parts of God's plan. Being in ministry, I know one of the top questions I get asked and one that I have asked so many times is, God, what's your plan for my life? Anyone ever asked that before? Hopefully you have, and maybe you're asking that today, and you're here for that reason. But when you think about that, there are a lot of unknowns, a lot of unclear things about that plan, aren't there? So many things that are just cluttered and confusing and clouded in our mind. But here's what I believe happens so many times, and I want to tie this to the sower's plan, that God has a plan for his seed and for your life and for his church and for his word, is that so many times we allow the unknown components of God's plan for our life, the things we don't know but we wish we did, We allow those things to clutter and cloud the things that we do know that God has planned for us. Like being unselfish, like being humble, like spreading the seed, like being that good soil that says, God, I can't produce a crop, but you can produce a crop through my life. And so you've given me ways to do that in your word. So I'm going to focus on those known, those clear things that you have commanded and called me to do. And then, God, as I do the known parts of your will and your plan, you're going to reveal to me the unknown parts of your plan and your will for my life. A lot of times we get so consumed and cluttered, just like the thorns. The thorns of life clutter the seed of God's word so much that we're clouded so much of what God is already telling us to do. We cloud the known parts of what God has commanded us to do because we're so focused on the things we don't yet know or understand. And as an inquisitive person, I shared even a couple of weeks ago that I always question, always asking another question, always looking for a black and white bottom line kind of an answer. And because of that, so many times I fall in this category uh, where I just clutter the things that God has very clearly called me to do because I just focus on the things I don't quite yet understand. The more you focus on that will, the known will of God, the more you'll be able to do God's will in your life. And so that's the point for that sower's plan. And secondly, let's look at the soil's production. The soil's production. Because the soil, when you think about this, that we are the soil, it's made to produce something. It's not just to be dirt. You put the potting soil in with your plants because you hope it will produce something and take somewhere, take off with the seed. And so in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19 tells us, For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so just so you know, you are dirt. Yes, Jesus called you dirt. And there's a lot of dirt in our life, isn't there? A lot of times we are pretty dirty people. Sin stains us, and the the description of dirt fits pretty pretty well at times. So just to make sure everybody's awake, and if your neighbor is sleeping, this will wake them up. Look to your neighbor and say, you are dirty. (laughs) Some of you spouses have been waiting just to be able to say that. That was your opportunity. I gave it to you. And now, the thing to think about for us, though, is you can look to yourself, and I won't make you do this this time, I'll give, you, I'll give you a break, but you can look at yourself in the mirror and go, you are dirty, you are dirt. But here is the thing about the soil's production and the seed of God's word. No matter how dirty your dirt of your life is, no matter how much dirt in your past, don't you feel like you've got that sometimes? There's some, you know, even this potting soil has got some little sticks and some things in there that really would hinder growth from taking place. But no matter how many hindrances are in your life and the dirt of your life, you can look and know that the seed of God's word, the plan of the sower that God is, is greater than the dirt of your life. And he'll even use bad dirt, good dirt, but God will use dirt to further his word and his kingdom and his power. Isn't that an exciting thing to know that we serve a God who can overcome any of those things in our past, any of the dirt that holds you back so many times in your life? Because you are dirt. You're right. You're dirty. 
I'm dirt. We're dirt. And it's okay to embrace that I am dirt. And I have dirt in my life. I'm dirty, but I serve a clean, holy, powerful God who owns the seed of his word and will further it even through the dirt of our life. Jesus looks at those soils and he explains them to his disciples and wants us to talk about those for just a minute. The wayside soil, verses 5 and 12. 5 is where he tells the story. 12 is where he explains those things. Is The path, that's the hardened heart. That would rec- represent somebody who would reject the gospel because their heart is hard. There's been times maybe you have been that person. You may be here today and you are that person. You are that kind of soil. And so I would ask you today, what type of soil do you identify with in this story? And that's a personal question that you can answer just between you and God today as we talk through these. But which one does, does represent your life the best? That hardened heart, that wayside, path soil, are those who reject the gospel because their heart is hard. The rocky soil. At times, there's a rock bed underneath some of the soil, and it would prohibit moisture from being able to to grab hold and let the root system of a plant take off and grow and expand. But things will spring up in such a shallow soil, and so many times, that represents our lives. We get excited about the gospel, and you may have been in that place so many times, but what will happen is your root system can't go deep. You can't get the moisture you need, and... So, so many times you'll just wither away and fall away, and it never was real to begin with. Another soil here is the thorny soil. This is something that has probably grabbed all of us at one point or another. The thorny soil is where the cares of the world, plenty of those, right? The cares of the world just clutter and confuse, and even though excitement and enthusiasm about what God's doing and about his word and the seed of the gospel would spring up, you get choked out by the cares of Of the world, and so it doesn't root or grow, it dies on the spot there. Then there's the good soil, and like I said about this potting soil, they're still bad even in the good soil, but a good soil Christian allows for roots to take place, and from there you get to even participate in the spreading of that gospel. And so, as you think about which of those you would identify with, I want to ask you two questions, and these two questions are going to be called soil surgery questions today. And sometimes we need some soil surgery, don't we? Some soil surgery. We need to do some surgery on the soil that is our life. And I want to give you two questions that will help us think through those areas of our life right now. The first question is this. Am I pursuing a doing faith or a being faith? Am I pursuing a doing faith or a being faith? There's a big difference in the two. Jesus wants us to know that the soil's production is always dependent on the sower's plan. If the soil of our life is going to produce fruit... It's not going to happen because we can produce fruit. We can't produce fruit in and of ourselves. We are not holy. We do not have the nutrients. We do not have the seed. We do not have the ability to make a difference in life and to really be what God has called us to be apart from his strength. But that's the beauty of what Jesus came to do. Amen? Amen. As he looked at us and said, you know what? They are dirt. (laughs) They cannot produce a crop without me. There cannot be fruit in their life without me. And so many times people look at the Bible. People look at Christianity. They look at faith and the Bible as this list of do's and don'ts. This rules and regulations book that I'll never measure up to. And you're right. You'll never measure up to it. But this book and the seed of the word of God is so much more than a list of do's and don'ts that we check off. This is about something that we can become. Not just something that we can do. We can do the things in God's word because we become the good soil that God has called us to be. Now, you may say, well, how do I become that then? If it's not about the doing, it's about the being. If the doing comes from the being, how do I be? And that's a good question. How do I be? What does it mean to pursue a a being faith? I'll tell you this. It starts with realizing your dirt, that there isn't anything good in, in and of myself. And I can't be productive soil apart from Jesus. And then it takes saying, I know that the sower, that God has a plan for me, and that's why he sent Jesus. And Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins and rose again, defeating death, because I could never defeat death. I could never be that sacrifice. And his plan for me is that I would accept that truth, not just believe in it, because even the birds of the air, Satan would come and take away those seeds from those hardened hearts. You'll never make that decision apart from a Holy Spirit and accepting a plan that's not your own plan. But God has that plan. And that's the beginning saying, I'm dirt and I need that plan. I'm dirty 
And then once you do that, you can take that a step farther and say, Jesus, I can't produce. I can't make disciples. You called me to be a part of spreading the seed of your word, but I can't do that apart from you doing it through my life. And I'm going to stop depending on me and start depending on you. And then all of a sudden, the doing part that has just plagued you all of your life becomes a natural part of who you are because Jesus is now at the center of everything you do instead of you being at the center of what we do. And we're all guilty of that. It's so easy to push Jesus off the throne of our life and to take that seat for a little while, isn't it? Amen. But when we put Jesus on that throne of our life, that's when we can become the soil that God has called us to be. And it becomes a being faith and not just a doing faith. The doing would flow from that. So am I pursuing a doing faith or a being faith? The second soil surgery question is a very big one. Am I pursuing good ideas or God ideas? I challenge you, write these questions down and ask yourself these questions this week because it's one thing to answer the questions sitting at Midway Church in a comfortable chair as we're being equipped to go out, but what about when you're in line at Walmart? Or what about when you're in traffic and the road rage sets in? What about those frustrating times when your spouse or your kids or your family or your friends or those coworkers just drive you nuts and you want to pull your hair out? What about if we ask ourselves those questions then? Would it change the outcome, the being, and the doing that flows from the soil of our life? (laughs) It gets real then, doesn't it? So those questions, am I pursuing a doing faith or a being faith? And then am I pursuing good ideas or God ideas? I've been guilty of looking so many times at these ideas. I'm an ideas guy. I love coming up with an idea and seeing it come from beginning to end and making those kind of things happen. But so many times I've let good ideas, things that even would fit into what God's called me to do, things that do make a good difference in others' lives, I get so focused on a lot of good things that I miss the great things that God wants me to do. The good ideas start to clutter and cloud out the God ideas. God has an idea, the sower's plan that we talked about. God has an idea for your life, a plan for your life. And so many times we, we live in this world. We're down here. There's good ideas down here. And those good ideas make a good difference. But all the way up there somewhere, God has these God ideas that just dwarf the good ideas that we have. And so many times we're boxed in, maybe by the the things that we think we're good at or not good at, and we live down here in this land, the good idea land, when the whole time, way up here, God's saying, I have this massive plan for your life that dwarfs everything you've imagined. Stop letting those things, those good ideas, or those bad ideas, or those bad seeds of negativity that someone's sown in your life hold you back from the God ideas and the big things I want to do in your life. Am I pursuing good ideas or God ideas? What does that look like? What's the God idea for your life this week? It's a tough question. It's something that we can wrestle with every single day. And the more we wrestle with that question and pursue the answer to that question, the more we're going to be that good soil Christian that God has called us to be. And when we do that, we're going to see multiplication happen. Every time the soil that accepts the seed of God's word, that good soil, even though there's bad pieces of soil in that soil, every single time the good soil gets combined with the seed, the timeless stories of Jesus, the power of God's word, multiplication will happen. We can't stop the multiplication that God's going to bring about, amen? But we can participate in it or not, and that's our choice in that. So we've looked at the sower's plan, the soil's production. Lastly, I want us to look at the seed's potential. The seeds potential. This is really at the heart of everything we're talking about today. When you think about these seeds, and you can't see them because they're so small, I think about what the seed represents as Jesus says it in his word. It represents the word of God. It represents what God wants to do in our life, the sower's plan that he revealed to us from his word. But I want you to hold your Bibles if you have them this morning. Do something that maybe you haven't done in a while, something God spoke to me about. Just hold it out in front of you and look at it for a minute, and I want to ask you a question. You can hold your phone out in front of you if you want as well. (laughs) Look at your Bible. Look at the words on the screen or on the page. And ask yourself this question. What do I hold in my hand? And just between you and God, answer that question. There'll be answers across the board, I'm sure, in this room. But what do I hold in my hand? Your answer to that question of what you hold in your hand about the potential of the seed that you hold in your hand really is going to have a lot to do with the potential of what you reach in your life when it comes to God's plan, the sower's plan for your life. When I think about that question, 
what do I hold in my hand right now? So many times it's another book, it's a library of books, it's a history book, you've heard it said, and all those things are very true and very, very viable, that there's a great plan of history and a recount of all the things that God has done. Sure, all that stuff's in there, and it's important that we know it, that we study it, that we understand it, but I want to tell you something even deeper about the seed's potential, the potential of what I hold in my hand. When I think about the master storyteller who told the stories that we read about, I don't see a timeline anymore. I don't see history anymore. I see I see a God who looked at me. We said a couple of weeks ago that awareness without action is apathy. <laughs> I see a God who looked at me and saw how dirty I was. A God who said, I care about him, and I'm going to take some action on his behalf, some action he can't take on his own. And I'm going to send my son and make a sacrifice for him he could never make. And then on top of that, I'm going to record all the steps of that process, and I'm going to write some things down. And with those things I'm going to write down through people on this earth, I'm going to say, and I want you to fill in your name into this blank, I'm going to look at every single day through the words on those pages, and I'm going to speak directly to blank, fill in your name. I see a God who looked at me no matter how dirty I was and said, I'm going to speak to him individually. I'm not talking about to the church as a whole, as a context here. Jesus wants to talk to you directly through the seed of his word. That's what I see in his word. Go ahead and celebrate that. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Amen. One that looks at us and wants to speak to us right where we are. I want you to think about the timeline of your life for just a minute. I've got an illustration that will help us visualize this perhaps for a few minutes here. You think about your life and how long it is and your life. How many of you had those days that just feel like they just go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? Life's kind of like that. Some of you say, man, my life's like that. It just keeps going and going and I can't ever get anywhere with it. But I want you to think about this rope. And if this rope represents the timeline of your life, It keeps going. Pretend it just keeps on going all the way around. It keeps going for eternity, and it never ends. And you think about where you're at right now. The red will represent your time here on earth. This is your time here on earth. Now, in all reality, if we wanted to make a really good visual, I wanted you to see it. But in all reality, it probably would look more like this. (laughs) It's just a speck on this rope of our life. But this represents your time here on earth. And before you, there was, and it kept going this way too. We just don't have a rope quite as long as, as God has lived. Amen? But before you, there have been seeds that have been sown. There's more time that seeds were sown. You're here today because seeds were sown. Your faith is here today. No matter where it stands, whether you would see yourself as a person of faith or not, it's here today. You're at Midway today because some seed was sown in your life before you got here. And God was here before you got here, just so you know. But here you are. Some of us are right here on this journey. Some of us are about in the middle. Some of us are right here. And I'm not just talking about age. It doesn't matter how old you are. You could be right here at the end of this time. You could be here. You could be here. I don't know. That's only for God to know. But here's what I do know. The Bible, the seed that we're talking about, the seed's potential that we're talking about here, when you look at your Bible and you answer that question we just answered, I read it, and if yours reads like mine does, it tells me very, very clearly that what I do during this time right here, the choices I make about the seeds that are sown into my life, the choices I make about Jesus is going to affect all the rest. And that's a short amount of time, folks. We don't have a lot of time. I mean, like I say, you could be here. But what you do with the seeds that are sown into your life during this red part of your life, what you do in the red, the choices you make in the red, how you look at Jesus in the red of your life, it's going to affect all the rest. And it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. But how many times are you like me? You get so caught up with the comforts and the pleasures that we could experience during this time. It's like, hey, well, I'm only here for a little while. I'm going to make it as comfortable and fun as I can make it since it's that short. And since he said it's actually really about like that, I'm going to make it as fun as possible. How many times do we take that approach to life and let's just live it up and make sure that, you know, I can just be comfortable while I can because it's going to end. And I don't, maybe you say, I don't even know what's going to happen on the rest of the rope. I don't know what's coming up next. So I'd like to know, but bottom line is I'm here and so I'm just going to enjoy it while I can. I don't know about you, but when I look at this and then I start to look at all the rest, I'm starting to become a little more concerned about that. 
I start to look at this and say, this isn't really that big. There's a whole lot more to this whole thing of eternity. This whole thing, this kingdom of God concept that Jesus keeps telling stories about, it's a lot longer than I thought, and so I'm going to be a little more concerned during this part about what I can do to affect this part. Not just for my life, but for the lives of other people. Because God wants to use you as a seed spreader. Ain't that awesome that we're just dirt? We're the soil that seed. Here's the thing. Soil is necessary. Soil is a, is a breeding ground for seed. <laughs> and God didn't have to use soil. He created it. But he chose to use the dirt that we call our lives to spread the powerful gospel, the seed of his word that affects all the rest of eternity. Aren't you glad you can be a part of that? Amen. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes this morning. And I want to talk directly I have several very important things I want to talk to those that know Jesus and those that don't. But I'm going to start with those of you who would say, I just don't know if I know Jesus. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and how I can sow into that. And this is the most important part of all we're going to do today. If you're getting baptized, I'll ask you to come back. Some of you have experienced that. We have one being baptized a little bit later on. You can go back and start to prepare for that. But as you think about that, no, nobody looking around, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. When you think about the red of your life and you say, I just don't know that the seeds of the gospel that's been sown into my life, that I've accepted it. I just don't know that if I die today, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. I want to talk directly to you. Nobody looking around, nobody moving around. So important. This is why we're here today. This is why Jesus spread the seeds of his gospel. I want to tell you today, God loves you so much that he sent his son. His son died for you. He rose again for you. He's alive right now so you can live forever with him. And what that looks like is something in the Bible that it calls repentance. It's a big biblical word, but I'll tell you what it means. It just simply means saying, I'm going to turn away from all that old me and I'm going to go towards the new me that God wants to create. I'm going to be born again, you've heard Jesus say. You say, what does that look like? It's about your heart. It's not about a prayer. It's not about a preacher leading. You don't have to be sitting in a church. It's about you saying, Jesus, and say this from your heart to his today. If you don't know, you would spend eternity with him. Say, Jesus, in your own words, Jesus, I need you to save me right now. I know that I'm dirt and I'm unclean. I believe you died for me and that you're alive. Please forgive me and wash away my sins. The old me is old news. I want to be the new me that you've created me to be. I give you me. The Bible says that if that's the condition of your heart, if you believe and you give your life wholeheartedly to Jesus today, that matter of the heart, that you shall be saved. And some of you made that decision today. And if you made that decision, I just want to pray for you right now. Nobody's going to come to you. Nobody's going to come and pull you out of the service. I just want to pray for you. But you need to acknowledge that, not just before somebody else like me, but before a holy God who has just saved you today. And if you did that, again, nobody's going to come to you. I want to ask you just to signify that by lifting up your hand. Do that right now. Say, pray for me. I pray to receive Jesus. I see you on the front. Awesome. Anybody else? Put them up. I see you all the way across the left, several of you. See you, sir. See you, ma'am. Keep them up. Anybody else? Keep them up. Praise God. I see you in the back. Awesome. Anybody else? Four or five of you for sure. Awesome. Let's pray. God, thank you for these who have made that all-important decision. And God, they've made a decision in the red of their life that's going to affect all of eternity. And the Bible says that all the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now because of sinners that come to repentance and come to that saving knowledge of you. We thank you for that today, Jesus. And we pray all this in your name. As your heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed, some of you are here and you're Christians. You know Jesus, but God's laid something specific on your heart today. Something specific on your heart that you need to do and take action with. A seed that you need to sow or a seed that has been sown in your life that you need to go and do something with perhaps. You you and only you know what that looks like for you. But if God's laid something specific on your heart today, I want to ask you to raise your hand as well. And I want to pray for you. Lift them and lift them high all across the building. Keep them up high. Pray for me out of something specific God's laid on my heart. Praise God. Awesome. All of you can put your hands down. God, I thank you for these who were real and transparent enough to say, I've got to take some steps because of the seeds that have been sown in my life and the seeds that you are asking me to sow. Lord, we thank you that we're a part of a church that sows seeds every single day, not just across the street, but around the world, all for your glory. And we thank you we can be a part of of that. And God, may we be the church, not just go to church, but be the church, a church that goes out and makes a difference in the communities that surround us in the world because of you and because of who you've made us to be. We love you, Jesus, and pray all this in your name. And everybody said, amen.